zone. Prehistoric. Giant. Very large. And they're certainly more than big enough to represent a danger to us. And the secret to even larger size may lurk in their ancient DNA. Code for a truly monstrous Croczilla. The propensity to become a giant is always present in the crocodilian lineages. I think the conditions are ready right now for a super croc. Sixty-five million years ago, a devastating extinction event wiped out most of the Earth's reptile giants. Today, one massive bodied beast remains. They avoided the extinction that nipped the dinosaurs in the bud, leaving only birds as descendants. It's really an incredible success story. They're one of evolution's most incredible survivors, revered by some as gods reviled by others as man-eaters. So never underestimate a crocodile in the water. If you get too close to it, then really, that's the end of it. Meet the world's largest reptile, the crocodile. They might not be quite as long as some of the giant snakes, but they're actually a lot heavier than those giant snakes, so they are actually the biggest reptiles on Earth. These prehistoric giants can grow to enormous sizes, yet fossil evidence reveals their ancient relatives grew even larger. If you go back 100 million years, there were crocodiles that were almost twice the size and probably about four to five times the weight of the biggest crocodiles today. In the late 1990s, paleontologists working in the Sahara Desert unearthed the bones of the largest crocodile ever known to roam the Earth, Super Croc. Super Croc is the nickname. Sarcosuchus Imperator, the imperial flesh croc. That is the technical name. Super Croc was probably 40 feet long. It would have been an absolute monster. Scientists think Super Croc like today's crocs, was a powerful predator stalking unsuspecting prey at the water's edge. And Sarcosuchus was doing the same sort of things as these modern crocodiles are doing, except it was doing it 100 million years ago. Millions of years later, a modern croc still hunts like super croc and haunts similar habitat. Yet can it grow to its ancient ancestors' gargantuan size? How big can it get? Here in Darwin, in Australia's Northern Territory, one potential Croczilla candidate dominates the region's tidal rivers and estuaries. Known locally as salties, these are the largest of the world's 23 species of crocodilians, saltwater crocodiles. The largest saltwater crocodile ever measured stretched over six meters long. Yet to outlast dinosaurs, you need more than monster size. You need a heavy-duty arsenal of survival traits. Salties have thick, armor-plated skin, muscular limbs, strong jaws lined with over 60 bone-crushing teeth, and powerful tails extending almost half their body length. It's one possible clue to their future size potential, honed to perfection by evolution. Crocodiles' bodies are designed to survive. I mean, they could lose a limb, it doesn't matter. The dominant males are often missing a limb. You have an animal that's a survivor, and it there's almost nothing that can get in its way. It's almost like a Ferrari now. It's had so much refinement done to the general body plan of a crocodile that what you've got now is you've got like, you know, the best possible crocodile that you could possibly have. Salty is your A1 predator. Something to watch out for. They eat humans every year. Very large, and they're certainly more than big enough to represent a danger to us. News accounts report lethal attacks. In rural Darwin in 2009, 
while swimming with her sister and two friends near a swamp called the Black Jungle. An 11-year-old girl vanishes. Police mount a ground search for the girl. Helicopters scan the bush from the air. The next day, they find her remains. Bite marks indicate her killer was a crocodile, measuring about three and a half meters. Trained crocodile catcher Robbie Risk was part of the search team. That was a really emotional event. And that took about a day to, um, to find any remains. When we did, you know, it was something that, you know, which you, don't, you know, you don't really want in your head. Groups of armed officers scour the area, setting traps throughout the floodplain, but they never find the culprit croc. Though attacks like this are rare, salties probably kill about a half a dozen people a year. Yet officials estimate there are up to 150,000 of them moving from rural tidal rivers into Darwin waters. The unique thing about Darwin is that it's essentially a city that's situated right in the middle of crocodile habitat. And as they spread to urban and suburban areas, the odds of attacks on humans may be increasing exponentially. If most crocodiles in the tidal rivers here didn't move, they'd get killed by other crocodiles. There's just not enough food and there's not enough space to go around. And this is why you've got saltwater crocodiles moving along the coast towards Darwin. And more and more crocodiles every year are found in and around Darwin. And obviously the potential for disaster is so much higher. Accidental run-ins with wild crocodiles are an ever-present danger here. But there's an even more dangerous phenomenon. Rogue crocs that attack people on purpose. Rogue crocodiles don't behave like normal crocodiles. And they represent a really very significant danger. Often rogue crocodiles are the kinds of animals which have successfully attacked someone. They realize how easy it is. And then they try and do the same thing again. And very much unlike other crocodiles, which tend to stay away from people, rogue crocodiles will try and seek people out. A uh, rogue crocodile is a problem crocodile. It's just got attitude and does, you know, wants to kill everything, really. To reduce the risk of an attack by a rogue or other saltwater crocodile, Darwin authorities operate an ongoing catch and remove management program. We've caught over 170 crocs this year, um, compared to last year, which was about 140. So we have actually caught a fair bit this year. Might even break the record. <laughs> what we're doing here is uh, just checking and rebaiting the trap. Croc catchers like Robbie monitor over 60 movable traps. They keep them baited, and when they find crocs inside, they remove them, mark them, and record their size. The largest salty Robbie's ever caught measured over 4.5 meters. But any size croc can do some damage. Three meters, four meters can actually crush skulls and stuff like that. When you work with crocodiles, you have to be very respectful of what they're capable of. And if it goes wrong, that's when you lose your hand, that's when you lose your arm, that's where potentially you could lose, lose your life. Today, crocodile specialist Dr. Adam Britton is riding along with Robbie. He's collecting DNA to help create a genetic map of Darwin's crocodiles. What we're doing is we're taking tissue samples from crocodiles that we're catching in Darwin Harbor, and we're comparing them with tissue samples from crocodiles that we're gonna be collecting across the northern coast of Australia. And what that's gonna do, hopefully, is tell us a little bit about where the crocodiles that are moving into Darwin Harbour are actually coming from. Dr. Britton's map may someday pinpoint a breeding colony of giants, but for now, his research is geared toward keeping the peace between humans and a potentially deadly crocodile species. What we can learn about these crocodiles is why they're moving and what's motivating them to move. And if there's a risk of crocodile attack, then you have to try and reduce that risk. And hopefully, we can figure out how to make it safer for people. And then people will be more likely to put up with crocodiles that live on their doorstep. Well, here we are at number two trap in Darwin Harbour. Just gonna give it a pull. 
as you can see, I've just tested the trap. The croc comes in. As he comes into the trap itself, he'll actually pull down on the uh, meat, the bait, which triggers the door. As I'll... So it's a pretty simple mechanism and it works, works pretty efficiently. All right, off to the next trap. As the team heads off to check the next trap, they can only guess what size beast will take the bait. A crocodile can grow as long as it lives. It's another clue to their future size potential. When most creatures mature, they reach a maximum size and growth stops. But crocodile size has no limits. It's a phenomenon known as indeterminate growth. In captivity, with a steady food supply and fewer survival challenges, crocodiles may be able to live longer and grow larger than crocs in the wild. These animals pretty much grow until the day that they die, so it is uh, possible that these animals are going to reach much greater sizes in captivity than they normally would in the wild. One of the largest captive crocs ever recorded, a saltwater crocodile named Gomek, lived here at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm Zoological Park in Florida. Gomek maxed out at over 17 feet, weighing nearly a ton. He became a main attraction, drawing audiences to his feeding shows in droves. Today, his supersized legacy lives on in another huge salty named Maximo. So he's over 15 feet long, 1,200 pounds. He's an incredibly powerful animal. Working with carnivores as large as Maximo carries extreme risks. Zoo staff is always cautious. I said he looks at us uh, as a potential food source, so uh, you certainly need to watch out for that. Um, he's surprisingly quick for an animal his size. You can see the power in this animal when he jumps up after a rat. It's just something you really don't want to get too close to. Maximo's size may be what draws onlookers to his enclosure. Yet like other crocodilians, his most remarkable trait may be intelligence. Crocs are definitely the smartest of all the reptiles. They have the most well-developed cerebral cortex of any reptile. And they're a lot smarter than people think they are. Crocodilians have a reptile-sized brain. I mean, it's literally the size of a walnut. And yet, they are incredibly smart animals for what they need to do. And some of what they do is pretty spectacular. In the wild, crocs seem to have an eye for detail. They can read their surroundings and respond by changing their behavior. You can go into an environment, be observed by crocodiles that you never see, and you will never see them again. They didn't see you. They, they didn't like the way your clothes were. They didn't like the way you moved. They didn't like your boat. They hadn't seen your boat on the river. They noticed something was up. You will never find them again. they may also display some form of memory. To be a crocodile, you want to know where the best place to hunt is going to be on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can't just stumble upon it every day. You have to remember, you have to learn. And here in captivity, some crocodilians, like this alligator named Bomber, seem to show thinking. You tap him on the snout, he'll open up, throw a nugget of food in there, and he'll slam shut on he gets a meal and somehow realizes that you want him to do that. The first time he'll do the trick just fine. The next time he'll move back about two inches. The next time about four inches. So he'll keep moving back. And what he's doing is it seems to be that he's trying to lure you into the water to the point where you'll fall in. And God knows what he wants to do with you from there. This animal is thinking. I mean, this is, this is a learned behavior. These ancient survivors are more than creatures of pure instinct, and Maximo's no exception. And he's learned a routine for the show, and he knows time of day, so if we walk up onto that platform right at 3 o'clock, he starts going through his routine that he has to go through for the feeding show. So that didn't take him very long to learn at all. Maximo! He was trained to kind of a three-tap cue, so if you kind of pound the boardwalk three times, he'll still react to that. A lot more intelligent than most people probably give him credit for. Smart, powerful, 
huge, and still growing. Maximo is just 40 years old. At four and a half meters, 544 kilos, he can grow for decades. Only time will tell how much bigger he can get. Well, it looks like we're gonna crock in this trap. Yeah, be about two and a half meters. Back in Darwin, the team finds a salty in one of the harbor traps. Robbie estimates it's about two and a half meters. First, what we're gonna do is uh, chuck a snap rope over the top jaw, and then we're gonna disable his jaws with a zip tie, and then we'll bring him out of the top of the cage. They have to get it onto the boat, but first, they have to secure its jaws. To get the croc to open its mouth, the croc catcher taps it on the snout. He slips a snout rope around its upper jaw. But the noose is caught on the croc's upper teeth. Just gotta bring it back a bit more. Nah. Finally, the noose slips over the teeth and into position around the upper jaw. Now I'll jump on the trap and I'll disable the jaws with a zip tie so we don't get close enough to the croc ourselves. So there's no interactions between us and the animal itself. So no one's going to get hurt. Now what we're going to do now is just duct tape his jaws together and then cover his eyes. Covering its eyes helps minimize stress. Eyes covered, jaws are secured. Now we're ready to bring them out of the trap. And just securing his back legs where they get most of their power from. The final part, just a bit of protection there from his uh, other teeth that are protruding over the top jaw. So when we do handle him, we won't cut our, cut our hands up and stuff. Even with the croc's jaws zip tied and taped, with one swing of its head, its large teeth can tear open human flesh. With a wild salty captured for relocation, Robbie and the team loaded onto the boat. Stop. Beautiful. When the croc's secure, the team ties new bait, resets the trap, and heads off to check the next one. Here in Queensland, Australia, in the rivers and swamps surrounding Cooktown, some fear croc populations and attacks may be on the rise. In 2005, a crocodile measuring nearly four meters dragged a fisherman from his canoe and killed him. Park rangers located the croc and shot it. More recently, in 2008, on the banks of the Endeavour River, when a 62-year-old man left his campsite to check his crab pots and failed to return, his wife called authorities. Once on scene, they find crocodile slide marks down the riverbank. A full-scale search turns up one of the man's sandals and watch. Weeks later, authorities discover the man's remains inside a 4.2 meter croc. Experts say attacks like these are just freak accidents, but some locals worry. If crocs continue to spread to areas inhabited by humans, more fatal encounters may be inevitable. In Florida, at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, biologist Dr. Gregory Erickson is studying a crocodile's main predatory tool, its bite. We're trying to understand uh, what makes these animals tick. 
We're interested in uh, how the musculature and the, and the mechanics of the jaws allow them to generate their bite forces and how the shapes and sizes of the teeth contribute to the pressures that these animals use to make a living. These are our bite force transducers. When it bites down on this, it's going to exert a force, and this is a four sensor device, like a good bathroom scale, and it's going to send out uh, a signal uh, to a charge amplifier that's going to record the bite force. He starts by prepping a specially designed bite force meter. The meter's leather pad is it doesn't hurt their teeth. Uh, and as soon as you touch one of their teeth, it, it, it triggers uh, a snapping bite, is what we call it, and they'll slam down, uh, apparently with as much force as they can possibly generate, and we'll get a recording instantly of what the maximal bite force was. I'm not exactly sure what this Nile crocodile is going to do. They, they tend to be uh, rather surly animals. Together with curator Kevin Torregrosa and another park staffer, Dr. Erickson enters the croc enclosure. She's, she's a mad motor scooter. The crocodile fights, rolling and wrapping itself in the rope. Oh. But finally, the team lifts the croc out of the water and onto an examination board. What we're going to do is throw the board in. I'm going to push the jaws down on the board. You're going to put the mouth pull on to hold his jaws on the board. And we're going to tape it up. I hate that part. <laughs> A wooden block props open the animal's jaws and prevents it from clamping down. Right there would be good. Okay, cinch it down, tight. What I'm doing is I'm taking dental putty. It's essentially the same material your dentist uses to cast your teeth when you're going in for dental work. And I'm gonna use this to make some copies of the more prominent teeth in this animal. Don't do this at home. Don't do this with your pet crocodile. Or your dog, for that matter. <laughs> Before taking bite force readings, Dr. Erickson takes dental impressions. By making molds of the teeth, then we can make casts of them. And essentially, we can walk away with a, a replica of the teeth. From that, we can do studies uh, as to how much pressure they actually generate at the tips of their teeth. But we really don't understand how the teeth work. And so that's what we're trying to do in this research. I hate doing this. It's, um, it's not a natural thing to do to put your hand in the mouth of a crocodile. It's for the cause, I guess. This will set uh, in about five minutes, so we'll be able to pop that right off and hopefully get this animal back in the water as soon as possible. Another clue to crocodiles' future size potential, predatory skill. Crocodiles are classic ambush predators. In other words, they stalk silently and attack rapidly. They can hide in a river with just a nostril and an eyeball sticking above the water and prey on something that has no idea what's about to happen. Crocodiles are masters of their habitat. To hunt, they often just sit and wait. All animals have to have water, and so you've got a constant source of food coming to you, and all you have to do is get good at catching it. It doesn't really matter who the players are coming to the water's edge. The crocodile doesn't care as long as it's a meal. Hidden with its eyes, ears, and nostrils sticking just above the water's surface, a crocodile can use its powerful senses to home in on prey. They have these pressure receptors around their jaw, and literally, they can detect changes in pressure through the water. They have an excellent sense of smell. They can smell animals and prey from quite a long distance away, and it could be several kilometers away. The hearing's actually better than ours at low frequencies, and so they can hear the rustle of 
footsteps. They can hear animals moving through grass. Their eyesight is excellent too. They've got full color vision and they can see at night very effectively. Once locked onto a target, a croc approaches unseen, propelled by its powerful tail. It's the, the driving force that allows them to be able to swim at great speeds, but more importantly, to slowly swim without creating a lot of uh, turbulence. And if they see something come close to the water, they'll swim underwater for a distance, and then they'll come up a little bit closer, and they'll have another look, and they'll see what the situation is. And they'll keep getting closer and closer, and all that prey item has to do is get sufficiently close to the crocodile, and as soon as that happens, bang, that's it, it's all over. Launching an explosive surprise attack, a crocodile bites down with bone-crushing force. Dragging its victim into the water to drown it, Sometimes, it goes into a death roll. The crocodile may roll to try to disorient the prey item. Uh, sometimes the, the animal's dismembered at that point. Maybe the animal will die nearby from bleeding. Ideally, the crocodile's trying to drown the prey item. Once the animal's drowned, of course, uh, then it's secure to meal. Once its prey is dead, a crocodile uses its body to tear it to pieces. They just simply rip it apart with a motion of their head. They're like a tube of muscle, a little bit of flexibility, especially in the neck region, the armor. There's a little break in the armor there, so it can just yank its head back and forth and just literally rip limbs and bodies apart. Gravity helps it swallow. Okay, let's see if this is all right. Back in Florida, Dr. Erickson removes the dental putty from a nearly two and a half meter crocodile's tooth. This animal's really powerful. You saw right there, just, just touching that tooth set this animal off. It, uh, it, it, they're, they're a lot faster than we are, so you have to be careful. I mean, if, if we hadn't had that mouth uh, taped shut, I'd, I'd be uh, heading for the hospital right now. <laughs> Never want to reach down in, into this area. We call it the hitting zone. Got a really nice mold here of the malariform teeth as well. And so we'll take these back to the lab and we'll make some replicas of this crocodile's teeth. With molds removed, Dr. Erickson prepares to measure the croc's bite force. Here we go. Oh, Ooh. missed it. Just missed it. Okay, so what happened? Here's the the croc saw the bar coming. They try again, hoping for a more direct hit. All right. 375. Yeah, this animal's starting to, to tire a little bit, and so that's probably all we're going to get. Yeah. Roughly 400 pounds of force. With full energy, it's potentially capable of even greater forces. And as it grows, so will its bite. As the team releases the croc, it races off. Dr. Erickson will take his molds, bite force readings, and measurements back to the lab for analysis. With the, the bigger crocodiles, such as uh, the saltwater crocodiles, we're getting numbers approaching 4,000 pounds. Almost twice what we see in uh, the spotted hyena, which is the bone-crushing champion among mammals. It's also twice as high as what you see in a Bengal tiger or an African lion. Over 1,800 kilos of force eclipses any animal on the planet. Dr. Erickson believes the huge force is necessary for its survival. Most crocodiles don't have particularly sharp teeth. They're blunt instruments, not well designed for puncturing things. 
but with the kind of forces these animals generate, they are able to produce pressures that are high enough to puncture through hide and sustain impacts with bones. And they pull it off, and they've been doing it for a long time, and they're pretty good at it. Back in Darwin, after finding a second croc in a harbor trap, Robbie and his partner transfer their catches to a truck. Measure them up. And then identification numbered. We always keep the heads up just to uh, stop them from, you know, regurgitating. And then they could drown because, you know, their jaws have been taped up. This is a uh, receipt book here. Um, this is the, what goes to the, to the croc farm and we keep the other half. Record the sex and how we actually caught them and also the uh, size of the animal. Okay. Uh, the feature for these two crocs here are uh, decided by the croc farm who we give them to. Being one a female, a fairly large one, they'll use for a breeder. Where the other one is a male, they'll probably use for skin product and or meat product. Yep, two less out of the harbour for, for us to, to worry about, uh, which is good, I'm glad we got them. And there's plenty more to catch. Another clue to crocodiles' future size potential? They're one of nature's most adaptable animals, capable of feeding on a wide range of prey, from small fish to beasts as big as kangaroos. They're feeding on things such as clams and crustaceans and even insects, fish, frogs, you name it, turtles. They're able to feed upon a broad range if the opportunity presents itself or if they're forced to do so just uh, due to diminishing resources. Crocodiles can also adjust their behavior to their environment, especially if they locate a good food opportunity. And when crocodiles see an opportunity, They'll come back the next day, and if the same opportunity is there, they'll come back the next day, and they will learn very quickly that this is the place to be if you want to have any chance of catching food. But they can do even better than that. They can learn timings. They can learn, for example, that if a migration is happening during September or during April of a certain species of fish or a certain species of mammal, and that that's the best time to catch them, you can guarantee that a couple of weeks before it happens, the crocodiles will start migrating into that area. And if food isn't available, they can go months without eating. When they finally do eat, they use food efficiently, converting it into energy for growth. Crocodiles' extreme adaptability has helped them survive while other species have gone extinct. Today, they remain the planet's last truly massive reptile. But recent fossil discoveries reveal a lineage of even larger crocodilians. In the 1990s, paleontologist Paul Sereno and a team of researchers stumble upon the find of a lifetime, the ultimate killer zilla, Sarcosuchus imperator, super croc. Back about 15 years ago, I set foot in the Sahara. It was an exciting and very difficult expedition to try and open a, a Pandora's box of dinosaurs. But what was really eye-opening was the crocodiles. And in fact, the very first bone I found belonged to Super Croc. Then we found the skull. To see a six foot skull, something that is longer than you are when you lay down next to it, and realize that that's, that's a crocodile, it is amazing. I mean, we marveled at it when we were in the field. Roughly 110 million years ago, Super Croc stalked the banks of a river coursing through what is now arid land. Super Croc was, was an ultimate stealth predator, ambush predator. It had enormously powerful jaws and teeth that were like stubs, they were like hooks. They were definitely not designed for eating fish. They were designed for eating dinosaurs. They were designed for pulling dinosaurs down to the water, drowning them, ripping them apart. And the tail is like 
I don't know, it's like the trunk of a sequoia. It's, it's too big to wrap your arms around. It's absolutely monstrous. Well, they probably had bite forces, uh, perhaps as high as 20,000 pounds or something like that, and God knows what kind of pressures they were generating. In his lab at the University of Chicago, Dr. Sereno continues to marvel at Super Croc's fossilized skull. This is the most complete skull of, of a giant Super Croc ever found. It's six feet long, weighs about 700 pounds. The back end of the skull is here. Here's the two eye sockets. They're sort of raised up. Here's the snout. Here's the big opening for the nose. The animal is basically a magazine of teeth. This is the root. The dark part is the crown. This is the part that sticks out. This is a replacement tooth. So most of the tooth is actually in the jaw. When you put this into the skull, you realize that the snout is like a machine gun of teeth. There's teeth going down to each side, filling the snout. And they're being replaced all the time as they break off and wear. Just from the teeth, you can tell quite a bit about what, what the animal was eating. And this is not a fish-eating tooth. So. This is the skull of a very large living crocodile. It's about two feet long, and this would be a crocodile that might be uh, 17, 18 feet long. Uh, you can see how it pales into insignificance compared to this monster super crack skull. But they're designed very similarly. So, how big was super croc? They're about twice the size of the largest saltwater crocodiles, and probably somewhere in the region of about 10 times as heavy. Well, we think uh, Super Croc was 40 feet long as a full adult. Yes, a croc the size of a school bus. How much did it weigh? Eight tons is a good estimate. The largest crocodile to ever uh, survive on Earth. In Australia, croc catcher Robbie Risk and his partner are relocating two saltwater crocodiles from Darwin Harbor to a nearby croc farm. Ah, here they are in their new home. Here we go, here. Yeah. So, two nice crocs. Yep, two very nice, nice ones. One female, one male. Oh, female, eh? Yeah, one female. Oh, feet they'll be very pleased with that. Yep. We'll just lift them up and put them straight in. With the crocs off the truck, Robbie heads back to the harbor to continue his work monitoring the traps. Right, now there's a bit they're not going to like. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is take a uh, take a tissue sample. Uh, from this crocodile. Um, these, uh, these Dr. Britton here, hopes the tissue samples will yield genetic taken. material for his DNA map of Darwin's croc population. Now, this is basically just cartilage, but it's got some genetic tissue in it. So what I'm going to do is use one of these biopsy punches and just take a bit of that tissue and store it in one of these vials. And then we're going to do some analysis on it to find out if we can determine where this crocodile came from. Uh, this is actually the first time I've used this technique. Okay, that works a bit better. Obviously, uh, that obviously stings a little bit, but for these crocodiles, they've got such thick skin. It's probably a bit like us having an injection. So that's the sample I've taken. It's just basically a hole through the scoot, and it's just connective tissue, really. But we can get some genetic information from this. Stick it in there. So we can keep this for however long we need to, and then we send these down to the lab, along with lots of others, and we should get some really useful information out of it. Armed with his DNA data, his research may one day uncover where Darwin's saltwater crocs are breeding, why they're moving, and how expanding into new habitat may help them grow to even larger sizes. 
with bodies built to survive, predatory expertise, indeterminate growth, and extreme adaptability. Can today's saltwater crocodiles become tomorrow's super crocs? I think the conditions are ready right now for a super croc. In warm climates, the, the very largest river systems, I think, could support a huge crocodile. Temperature is certainly a factor for, uh, for growth. These animals do have a fairly slow metabolism, but if the weather's warmer, they're going to be eating a lot more. It certainly could help them grow a lot larger. Warming temperatures and large prey may drive crocodiles to even greater sizes. If large prey evolved near the water's edge, I think it's quite plausible, possibly even likely, that uh, giant crocodiles would evolve again. But experts say there's one primary key to reaching the size of super croc, prolonged adolescence. And what we found is that these animals took about, oh, 35 to 40 years before they started slowing down their growth. Large crocodiles today, somewhere between 12 and 15 years, they'll start slowing down their growth. These giants was, uh, you know, maturing later and, and living a lot longer. How did super croc get so big, 40 feet in length? Did it grow faster or did it, did it grow over a longer period of time? They just took longer to grow. These giant crocodiles were growing at comparable rates to big crocodiles today. So they didn't necessarily grow faster, they just prolonged sort of their teenage years. With the right circumstances and an extended adolescence, modern crocs may someday morph into future giants. Body size is one of the easiest things for evolution to change. Just a handful of genes a couple of glands going on and off at different times, and you can enlarge yourself beyond what you once were. What happened during crocodilian evolution is, is on about, oh, six, seven, maybe even eight occasions, crocodile lineages reached gigantic proportions, animals 35 feet or more. The propensity to become a giant is always present in the crocodilian lineages. Life is not constant, life will change. And it may be possible that in the future, something as large and impressive and awesome as Sarcosuchus might one day exist again. So, how big can it get? If future salty size up to super croc proportions, this is what a croczilla might look like. A fearsome predator clocking in at more than 12 meters, 7,000 kilograms. With a tail almost five meters long, a near two meter skull, teeth like railroad spikes, and jaws capable of biting down with over 9,000 kilos of pure predatory force. One colossal example of how big it can get.